is Frederick E-R-I-C-K-A-L and A-L-L-E-N Fosdale, F-O-S-D-A-L. You have received a medical education, is that correct, Doctor? Yes, I am. I'm a physician. Would you tell the jury the manner in which you received that medical education? I first graduated from the University of Wisconsin in Madison in 1960 uh, with a, a major in psychology. And then I, <clears throat> then I attended the University of Wisconsin Medical School from 1960 to 1964 and achieved or received my doctor of medicine degree in June of 1964. I then completed a one-year internship in internal medicine at the U.S. Public Health Service Hospital in San Francisco, California. That was for one year. And then I returned to Madison, uh, Wisconsin, and started my psychiatric residency, which is a three-year specialty. Uh, halfway through my residency, I was drafted into the United States Army, and I spent three years in the Army as a psychiatrist and a flight surgeon. And uh, that was from March of, <coughs> excuse me, March of 1966 until March of 1969. And then I returned to Madison, <clears throat> finished my residency in psychiatry, and then uh, took a fourth year fellowship in uh, legal psychiatry or forensic psychiatry. Where did you take that fourth year in fellowship in uh, forensic psychiatry? And that was also University Hospitals in Madison. And was that from July of 70 to June of 1971? I believe so. Would you tell the jury what forensic psychiatry is? Uh, forensic psychiatry, well, first of all, psychiatry is a branch of medicine. And then forensic psychiatry is a subspecialty in the field of psychiatry. And it has to do with legal consultation in civil and criminal matters. I think before we go further, I'd like to have the uh, ask to the jury the uh, vitae of the uh, Witness. opportunity to explain what forensic psychiatry is? Yes, I did. What, what postgraduate training did you undertake after completing the fellowship? I've certainly taken numerous seminars, workshops, uh, primarily in, in general psychiatry and especially in forensic psychiatry. Uh, I attended the Institute of Law and Psychiatry at the uh, University of Southern California uh, on about three occasions in the early 1970s. These were for uh, further training in forensic psychiatry, uh, 1970, 71, and 72. And I've had certainly other continuing medical education courses. Uh, on a variety of subjects, especially in forensic psychiatry. And you have listed those on your vitae, is that correct? Yes, I have. And do you all, have you also attended the summer course on law and psychiatry at the University of Wisconsin Law School for a number of years? During my fellowship, I sat through that summer course, and then later I became a panelist with the teaching professor uh, for several of those summers. I was not an official instructor. I had no official capacity with the University of Wisconsin Law School, but I was uh, primarily a, a panelist. Have you received certain uh, professional certifications? Yes, I have. Would you tell some of those to the jury? I was cert first certified as a physician by the National Board of Medical Examiners back in 1965, and then I was later certified by the American Board of psychiatry and neurology as a psychiatrist, and that was in 1972. Uh, I was later certified as a forensic psychiatrist in 1980 by the American Board of Forensic Psychiatry. 
Are you a diplomat in both of those boards? Certification means you are a diplomat, yes. Would you explain to the jury that process and what the significance of that is to be a diplomat? To be certified in uh, psychiatry, you have to have various training requirements and experience requirements. Certainly, I'm not sure what they are currently, but basically to finish your at least a three-year residency, uh, have some degree of experience. And back when I took the exams, we had a written examination, and if you pass that, then you had an oral examination whereby you uh, examined a neurological patient and was and were quizzed by a panel of neurologists and psychiatrists about the patient and also two psychiatric patients where you were uh, quizzed about these two patients. So it's an all-day affair. Uh, as far as the American Board of Forensic Psychiatry exams, uh, that was also, you had to be certified first as a psychiatrist before you can take the licensing or certification exam in forensic psychiatry. And also they wanted you, the board wanted you to have a, a special interest in forensic psychiatry, perhaps some degree of advanced training and experience. <clears throat> and then you take a, excuse me, <clears throat> you take a written examination. And if you pass a written examination, then you um, <clears throat> take oral examinations. Whereby you are questioned on your submitted reports, you uh, uh, even interview a potential defendant or you watch a videotape of a defendant and uh, you're questioned on it for several hours about a variety of forensic subjects. Were you the first uh, physician in Wisconsin to receive, to become a, uh, a diplomat of the American Board of Forensic Psychiatry? <clears throat> yes, I was. And what year was that? Uh, that was in 1980. You are also a diplomat in the, uh, <clears throat> or a fellow in the American Psychiatric Association, is that correct? That's true. Would you explain to the jury what it means to be a fellow in the American Psychiatric Association? The American Psychiatric Association is the national organization of psychiatrists. Uh, and there are various membership categories. And uh, back in 1976, uh, the Wisconsin Psychiatric Association advances your name along with other people to the national organization uh, for promotion to fellowship, which is somewhat of an honorary status, requires varying degrees of training, service, experience, that type of thing. And, so and in 1976, I was uh, made a fellow in the American Psychiatric Association. Did you later become a fellow in the American College of Forensic Psychiatry? <clears throat> yes, I did. And would you explain that procedure? Uh, <clears throat> basically, that's a smaller organization of, <clears throat> of forensic psychiatrists. And um, upon submission of various records, experience, training, uh, their, bo <clears throat> their board um, screens you, and if they think you qualify, then you're also elevated to a fellowship status. And so both those fellowships involve recognition by your peers before you advance to those fellowships, is that correct? That's true. This isn't something where you pay your dues and after you're there a certain number of years, you automatically become a fellow. That's true. I'd like to turn now to your professional experience. You indicated that you were drafted during the Vietnam incident. Can you briefly tell the jury uh, what transpired or what you did when you were uh, involved with the military in the Vietnam? This was while you were in training, while you were in residency, that you were drafted out of I was residency. drafted out of my residency, yes. Would you tell the jury what you did for the military during the time you were brought out of the residency? Uh, basically, since I had psychiatric training, I was uh, used as a psychiatrist. and. Um, during the Vietnam War, there was a strong emphasis on aviation and helicopters and what have you, so I was, there was a great need for f flight surgeons. So I was also programmed through the flight surgeon course at Fort Rucker, Alabama, uh, which also authorized me to ch treat aviators. And uh, 
I was just assigned to uh, various posts. I was, which basically uh, Fort Lewis, Washington, which. Uh, to Were you country. also in San Francisco and then later yeah, chief? Later, to, later spent a year at Letterman General Hospital in San Francisco, which is a major army hospital, and I was transferred to Savannah, Georgia where I was the uh, chief of psychiatry for Hunter Army Airfield and also Fort Stewart, Georgia. Is that in Savannah, Georgia? Fort Stewart is about 30 miles inland west of uh, Savannah. From 1970 to 1977, were you a forensic consultant with the Central State Hospital? Yes, I was. Would you explain to the jury what the Central State Hospital was in those years and what your duties and responsibilities were? Uh, back in those days, uh, Wisconsin had three state hospitals, the Mendota and Winnebago Mental Health Institutes and the Central State Hospital in Wapan. Central, St Central State Hospital was Wisconsin's maximum security hospital where the forensic <coughs> or legal patients were. <coughs> Excuse me. Do you have <coughs> some water, Doctor? Do I have some. It'll, yeah, it'll straighten out. <coughs> the forensic patients in the state went there uh, people who were sent there from the courts of Wisconsin for evaluation as to their competency to stand trial. Uh, <clears throat> back then there was also a sex crimes program and the people who were found unable to stand trial and the individuals who were found mentally non-responsible uh, were committed to Central State Hospital. My role there was as an examiner and um, I started going there during my fellowship because that's where the forensic patients were being sent um, so I performed a, numerous evaluations on people sent there by the courts of Wisconsin as to their competency to stand trial and their suitability for Wisconsin's then sex crimes program. So the persons that were involved in sexual uh, matters, a variety of sexual assaults and so on were studied by you? Yes, Wisconsin had a post-trial but pre-sentence sex crimes program, meaning that these were people that were charged, convicted, but were not sentenced. The purpose of the program was to screen out those individuals uh, who were felt to uh, have sufficient sexual maladjustment and were somewhat treatable and to be placed in a special treatment program rather than going straight into uh, correctional channels. And during that time, those seven years, can you opine the number of, of uh, uh, sexual, uh, sec persons involved in sexual crimes that you examined for one purpose or another? I'm sure I saw a couple to a few hundred uh, individ individuals for the sex crimes program. But you mean a couple hundred to, to several hundred? I, I just usually say a couple to a few, yeah. Okay. Yes. I'm it's not clear in my mind. Is that hundreds you mean when you hundreds, say a couple yes. to a few? A couple to a few hundred okay. during those years. I did the same thing uh, after I transferred over to the Mendota Mental Health Institute and did the same thing uh, for. And, uh, and that was from 1974 to 1982 that you did that? Yes, I did. That was um, a day or a half, just part time I would go out there. It's near Madison and also see at that time the forensic clients in the state of Wisconsin were being phased out of Central State Hospital and they were closing down Central State Hospital and turning it over to the Division of Corrections, which it is now the Dodge Correctional Institute. Uh, and the Mendota and Winnebago Mental Health Institutes picked up on the legal, legal clients in the state of Wisconsin. So I did the same thing in Mendota, uh, usually one morning, half morning a week for several years. Right. Were you also a forensic <coughs> consultant at the Federal Correctional Institution in Oxford from 1974 to 1982? Yes, when the federal government bought the new Wisconsin-built prison in Oxford, I think it was back in around 74, uh, I was asked to be the consulting psychiatrist to that facility and did so, went up there about a day a month for several years to consult with the uh, uh, medical department and the psychology department. Have you also served as a forensic <clears throat> consultant with the Wisconsin Criminal Jury Instructions Committee in 1980? Yes, I did. And that brought you where the emphasis was more on law, but you could draw on your background of both law and medicine. Is that correct? Uh, that's true. Uh, 
The Jury Instructions Committee is an ongoing committee, I understand, of attorneys and judges, and they're always revising and studying the jury instructions for a variety of issues. And uh, back then, they were revising and investigating the <coughs> then <coughs> uh, the then jury instructions for this phase of a criminal trial, meaning the second phase or the mental responsibility phase. And they wanted my input as to uh, any comments I had, definitions, and that type of thing. So I did make some suggestions to them, uh, and some were considered and some were not. All right. You were also a forensic consultant for the Technical Advisory Service for Attorneys in Fort Washington, Pennsylvania. Is that correct? Yes, that's a national agency that uh, attorneys go to when they want uh, consultants in various areas. And uh, somehow they heard about me. And, uh, Yes. And, all right. And with respect to the Defense Research Institute, are you also a forensic consultant to that group? Yes, I, this is a civil insurance company organization out of Chicago, and uh, I occasionally get referrals from that organization. Were you also a, have you been a forensic consultant in the Wisconsin Department of Justice, Madison, and Milwaukee? Yes, that's the... Uh, Attorney General's Office in the state of Wisconsin, and I've had referrals from both their Madison and Milwaukee offices. Have you also served as a forensic consultant for the United States Department of Justice for the Western District of Wisconsin, that is in Madison, Wisconsin? Yes, I've had referrals from uh, uh, both the U.S. Attorney's offices in both Madison and Milwaukee. You've also served as a consultant with the Department of Social Security Disability Insurance in Madison, is that true? Yes, I perform numerous, uh, less so these days, but years ago I was a regular examiner for that agency performing evaluations on people who are applying for Social Security Disability. Have you also served as a consultant for the Veterans Administration Hospital in Madison from 74 to 76? Yes, I did. And as a consultant for the Wisconsin Department of Regulation and Licensing in Madison? Yes. Uh, Years ago, I did receive some referrals from that body. And as an, are you, have you served as an assistant clinical professor for the Department of Psychiatry, University of Wisconsin Medical School <laughs> from 1974 to 1978? Yes, I did. <clears throat> yes, I did. You've served as uh, other also in various roles in your professional associations. Is that correct? I've had various uh, offices with the Wisconsin Psychiatric Association. And I would say the main one. <clears throat> I was the editor from 1979 to 1986 of our, our newsletter. And you presently are engaged in practice as a member of the Psychiatric Services in Madison, uh, Inc. in Madison, Wisconsin. Is that so? <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> yes. I'm a member of a, uh, about a 15-member mental health group, psychiatrists, psychologists, and a, a few social workers. <clears throat> and I've been a member of that group since 1975. You've served as a, an examiner for the American Board of Forensic Psychiatry over several years. Is that correct? And would you tell us what that is? Uh, yes, I have. Uh, basically, as I mentioned before, there's an oral examination part. And uh, I was asked to be an examiner on, for about four years examining psychiatrists who have passed, and passed the written forensic examination uh, and were taking their oral part to become board certified in forensic psychiatry. Have you done the same type of work for the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology? Yes, I have. And this is where you're examining applicants to that board, basically? That's true. You've also served on the Wisconsin Judicial Council and Sanity Defense Committee in 1989 and 1990 uh, in drafting legislation revising the Wisconsin insanity law. Is that correct? Yes, and also back in 1979 to 1981, uh, um, both committees studied the present statutes in the state of Wisconsin relating to various psychiatric issues uh, like competency to stand trial and the mental responsibility statutes. Uh, some of the recommendations were adopted. 
the competency to stand trial statute that's now in effect as a result of those committees. Uh, the present statute covering the procedures following a person being found mentally not responsible a uh, result of that, the latter committee, and this went into effect uh, January 1st of last year. And these are positions to which with the, the, judicial, uh, the uh, um, judicial council are positions uh, that are in part influenced by leadership in the legislature. Is that correct? Leaders in the legislature? Legislators are on the committee and uh, eventually somebody puts forth a, a bill. And that's then reviewed by the council, is that correct? That's true. You belong to various professional societies which you have listed on your veto, <clears throat> is that correct? These are the present organizations I belong to. I, I belong to other organizations in the past, but I... You've been involved in numerous presentations through the years, and you've listed, listed some of them on pages four and five of the Vitae. Is that correct? That's true. And the vast majority of these relate to mental health issues and the insanity defense. Is that true? Criminal responsibility? Most of them have to do with uh, forensic psychiatric issues, and I've talked to a variety of organizations from uh, judges at their annual meeting on a couple occasions. Uh, the courts also have a summer criminal law and sentencing institute. I've talked to that um, and you also meeting on a couple occasions. I've talked to the Wisconsin Psychiatric Association a few times, other lay organizations. Uh, and you have also uh, published some articles in the area of forensic psychiatry, is that correct? I've done some writing in the area, not extensively. I think I have four or five articles uh, presently uh, in the uh, Wisconsin Bar Bulletin, which is the um, journal for the um, State Bar of Wisconsin. Would it be accurate to say, really, that from 1970 on, you have been a practicing forensic psychiatrist? Uh, forensic psychiatry has always been part of my practice. Uh, certainly in the Army, you do a great deal of administrative psychiatry, and uh, certainly kind of got involved with many people who were in trouble in the Army, and that's where I first started doing it. And I came back, and when part of my fellowship, I uh, had forensic experience and training, and then in my private, then I went in the private practice in the early 70s, and uh, was part-time forensic work, inpatient psych psychiatry, inpatient uh, hospitalization, and then outpatient psychiatry. Then later toward the uh, late 70s, it was too hard to juggle all three, and I dropped the inpatient work, and it was just forensic work, and all patient clients, pa well, patients. And then eventually, uh, uh, for the last couple years, I have not been involved in patient care, but it's uh, just, the, the forensic work has um, been so demanding and so time consuming and the scheduling problems and what have you, it's, it's very hard if you do much forensic work to uh, have an established outpatient practice where patients have regular hours because <coughs> my hours are so regular and I don't, you never know when you're going to be needed and you can't be uh, rescheduling your patients all the time because the patients need that. So basically, for the past several years, you've been practicing forensic psychiatry as your full-time work? The last couple of years, yeah. And you do that through this private corporation with your colleagues that you've described already, is that correct? That's true. I presently am not consulting with any agency. It's, it's full-time. You are not in any way a government employee at this time? I am not. I, through the years, since you started in 1970, you have examined many hundreds of persons for forensic purposes, is that correct? <clears throat> yes, <clears throat> yes I have. Uh, when particularly in the earlier years, they were m many of those were persons that had, were involved with some sexual difficulty, is that true? When Wisconsin had a sex crimes program, yes, uh, the common examination, <clears throat> both of Mendota and Central State Hospital was for admission screening for the sex crimes program. Since that time, you've also from time to time examined the <clears throat> persons from, for a sexual problem. Is that true? Uh, in the private work, uh, uh, some type of sexual assault is part of the most common charge uh, I see. 
And in terms of being requested by, to appear in Wisconsin courts, in terms of examinations for either competency or for responsibility, such as the proceeding as we are presently involved in, have you been involved in numerous such forensic assignments? Mm, yes, I have. And particularly with the area of non-responsibility, such as in this proceeding, can you tell us in, under what circumstances you were employed and by whom generally? In rough percentages, if you can. Uh, the referral for a mental non-responsibility examination is is uh, probably the most common type of referral, and I I do anywhere from 50 to 70 of those per year for a variety of charges uh, for uh, courts around the state of Wisconsin. Have you appeared uh, in, as in many counties, many or all counties of the state, if you know, through the years? I've had referrals from every county in the state uh, in the last 20 years. Um, uh, there are about five or six counties I've not testified in, but otherwise I've testified in all the other counties. And that may be either by the engagement of the district attorney, by the public defender, by private practitioner, or by appointment of the court. Is that true? Yes, most um, responsibility examinations are, are court appointed. Uh, I suspect I am, my name is recommended to the court by the district attorney's office and less commonly by uh, defense attorneys. And then you're appointed by the court as the court expert, is that true? Yes, the, the vast majority are, are court appointed. Um, my report goes to the court and my, my bill goes to the court. Right. The occasionally, occasionally there's a direct referral from a district attorney's office. Some counties uh, vary in how they administrate these referrals. Some judges don't appoint and it's all defense and district attorneys, most counties and Milwaukee County, everything comes through the court, uh, except occasionally there's a direct referral, like in this case from the district attorney's office. And you're saying that in most situations when you're testifying, you're testifying as did Dr. Palermo in this case as a court appointed physician? That's usually the way it is, yes. You've <coughs> testified within the last several months here in Milwaukee County as the court appointed physician in murder cases. Is that true? Uh, yes, I have. Uh, Milwaukee County clearly is the, uh, has the most number of referrals per year. I keep track of all this. And uh, so I'm down here. I always have work in Milwaukee County. Is, and is, yes, would you say no, is, recently? Is it safe to say that you have testified numerous times in the homicide cases uh, often as the court appointed <clears throat> expert uh, through the years on the issue of responsibility in a homicide case. That's true. You have sometimes uh, supported the plea of insanity and you have sometimes said no, the person was not insane. Is that accurate? Yes, I... Uh, sometimes my findings support the plea and sometimes they don't. Uh, over the years that's... I keep track of that also because uh, I'm commonly asked in court. So I started keeping track and that, that works out to uh, about 25% of the time or three out of 10 times depending on the year where my findings support the plea. The rest of the other seven times, uh, seven, eight times it does not support the plea. Right. So you have testified then in, in uh, you've talked about state courts uh, here in Wisconsin. Have you also testified in federal courts? Yes, I have. And on the same type of issues of responsibility and issues of competency? Yes, I have. Uh, you did ask me about the recent Milwaukee murder. I said you testified several times in the last several months here in Milwaukee. Oh. Is that correct on, on, in homicide cases? There were two cases in early January uh, where the, um, my findings supported the plea. There was not a a major contest. It was pretty much agreed to by all the examiners and uh, there was not a trial. There was a hearing of course and the um, findings were taken. And this is where you supported the plea of insanity in these other cases? You're speaking these were two homicide cases uh, uh, last month and right. Was that in January? That's, tr that's true. And have you on occasion seen patients or, or had referrals that related to individuals that had been active or had been involved in some necrophilic activity? I've seen cases over the years where the defendant uh, pretty much 
after the homicide, let's say a husband wife shooting case, the, the male defendant had engaged in sexual behavior with the wife after killing her. Uh, I've seen that on a few times. As a pure, let's pick on the morgues, a pure necrophilic individual working in a morgue uh, or an old fashioned grave robbing type individual. Uh, I don't recall a person like that. That's, that's pretty unusual. So you are presently then a full time forensic psychiatrist to doing such issues as competency and responsibility among your, in, among your ongoing work? It's about uh, two thirds criminal and one third civil, civil referrals, civil cases, personal injury, workers comp, other miscellaneous administrative insurance, personnel, employment, discrimination kind of cases. <clears throat> I offer Dr. Fosdell as an expert witness. <clears throat> Mr. Boyle. So the record's clear, how long have we known each other? We met it in a case in Sheboygan in 1975, and I won't tell you on interplanetary TV where we met, but it was um, in a homicide case in Sheboygan in 1975. We've known each other a long time. That's true. I have no objection to Dr. Fosdell's fault. If you can, you may continue. Doctor, you were engaged by the Mall County District Attorney's Office to, to become involved in this case as, as a forensic consultant, is that correct? I was. And incident there too, you received a stream of materials at various times, is that true? That's true. And that involved uh, informal police reports from particularly from the City of Milwaukee Police Department, some from West Dallas, some from Bath, Ohio. It involved uh, medical reports uh, and various other types of information, uh, is that true? Yes, I have quite a pile of materials. And quite a pile, all right. And did you also undertake, uh, uh, what, what do you do generally when you get a, a, a not guilty uh, in terms of uh, when there's a, a raising of the mental responsibility issue? Do you have a particular procedure or routine that you follow? Basically, the if I sit back, can people hear me? It certainly will last longer if I can sit back. Yes or no? Uh, basically, the routine is to, the routine is to uh, obtain collateral materials, and uh, eventually you interview the defendant, review their past life and functioning, where they've lived, work, family life, school, employment, all aspects of their past life, <clears throat> and then eventually you uh, talk to the person about the charges. Of, against him or her. And then you, during your examination, you're observing their behavior, how they're talking, their apparent mood, how they're thinking. You're assessing their ability to comprehend, talk. You're assessing their intelligence. All these parameters relate to what we call mental status examination. It's similar to a physician's physical, um, we are physicians, but it's similar to a physical examination in general medicine. The mental status examination is in uh, direct questions about certain parameters, but also an ongoing observation of the person throughout the interview. Uh, so then after the examination and study the materials, and sometimes you see the individual once, several times, sometimes you interview outside resources, you, um, submit a report and you try to apply your clinical findings to the question being asked and in a case of a mental non-responsibility exam examination, uh, you try to uh, answer the questions of whether or not there was a mental disease or defect uh, at the time of the offense, mental defect, which goes back to my consultation with the jury instructions committee in Wisconsin is defined as mental retardation. Um, <clears throat> mental defect is not an issue in this case, but um, some defendants are mental retarded. Uh, you try to answer the question as to whether or not there was a <clears throat> mental disease during the time of the offense, and then you try to determine or at least run an opinion as to <clears throat> whether or not the <clears throat> mental disease caused the required degree of impairment in the defendant's capacity to appreciate wrongfulness and to be able to conform their conduct. So that's a standard for mental non-responsibility in the state of Wisconsin, and it's called the American Law Institute Test. 
and it's been our standard since around 1969. Incident to that referral and the receipt of the various materials that were forwarded to you, did there come a time or times when you undertook to meet with the defendant and to conduct interviews of him? Uh, yes, I was called in the day after his arrest. Uh, and I came to Milwaukee to potentially see him. Mr. Dahmer was uh, apparently willing to be interviewed, so I was called in, and I was here the Wednesday afternoon of his, after his apprehension, but there was so much else going on, and eventually it was, it was decided, oh shoot, it was decided, I just need a towel, it was decided that uh, I would not examine him. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. We get some paper toweling up here. I'm glad I said it was shooting, not something else. On, <laughs> on interplanetary television here. Yeah. <laughs> I think this is the second time this morning I've done this. <laughs> Doctor, there did come a time then that you visited. In fact, there came five separate times that you visited with the defendant. Is that true? That's true. And was that particularly on the 16th of October, the 23rd of October, the 13th of November, the 20th of December, all in 1991, and the 9th of January in 1992? That's true. So over the period roughly from December, strike that October 16, 1991, to January 9, 1992, you saw him for five times. Yes, I had five interviews with, with Mr. Dahmer. Right, and Four in Milwaukee and one at the Columbia Correctional Institution where he was sent. Why don't we take care of that and then... Uh, uh, that's fine, we can continue. This is... I have some water spilling stories, but uh, <laughs> we won't take the time. Well. Can you tell us over those five visitations the total number of hours that you spent with him approximately? Uh, my total, I log in when we start and when we end an interview because you're commonly asked in court how much time you spend with somebody so you, you learn to, um, you learn to uh, keep track of your time. Right. Uh, I, it, I came up with 17 hours and 15 minutes so. No, approximately 17 hours. And that was over the total of those five visitations? That's true. And as a result of uh, seeing, I'm going to first ask your conclusion, then we'll go into the greater detail on it. As a result of having visited with the defendant the five times that you did, over the uh, some, was it 17 hours you said? I'm sorry. That's true. Over the 17 hours, as a result of the various materials, you're reading the materials you received uh, uh, from the sources that I've already cited, and drawing on your experience and your training, did you form a, a professional opinion within the medic, did you form an opinion to a reasonable de degree of professional certainty within the field of medicine as to the psychiatric condition, the mental condition, of the defendant at the time that he was involved in the 15 slayings which are the subject of the filed information? Yes, I do. Would you recite that to the jury, that opinion? Uh, I will do this through um, sharing my diagnostic formulation of Mr. Dahmer, right. which Just will cover the time periods of the various offenses. And I'm, this is also described in my January 10th report. Right. At this time, I'm, we will go oh, into the report is, later, but just the, did you, the, the basic question, so the jury The basic question that. is that um, he did have a psychiatric disorder, not counting his alcoholism, during the time of these charges. His, his psychiatric disorder, uh, in my opinion, is a type of sexual disorder. Yeah. It's not specific, uh, falls into the category which uh, has been mentioned in court before, the not otherwise specified, uh, and primarily uh, necrophilia, which is a, uh, 
falls in the category of not otherwise specified. Uh, this is a type of sexual disorder, referring to a type of sexual maladjustment. Uh, so I use that diagnostic category to at least note that this is the main area, uh, one of the main areas of his uh, psychiatric uh, unhealth. And so he had this disorder, obviously, during the times of these offenses. He had it before, during, and after uh, these offenses. Uh, my opinion is that uh, this disorder, in and by itself, did not cause him to lack substantial capacity to appreciate the wrongfulness of his conduct, and did not cause him to uh, lack substantial capacity to be able to conform his conduct to the requirements of law. The disorder explains his motivation and explains his behavior, but this disorder uh, did not cause him to uh, lack the uh, substantial capacity. All right, I'd like now to go at this time into the interviews that you conducted and the information that you received. First, would you uh, undertake to advise the jury uh, where you met on October 16, 1991. Uh, you have before you the notes as you interview him, you take notes, you then cause those notes to be typed up, is that correct? And you have those notes before you of the interviews, is that so? Yes, I take uh, fairly extensive handwritten notes during my interview. Occasionally I will tape part of an interview, um, not very often, but occasionally I will tape an interview. Uh, my last interview, I did t tape part of it, uh, and then I dictate my notes for clarity purposes and also to uh, share with the attorneys involved the information I obtained from a defendant so everybody can see what I learned and um, uh, the basis for my opinions. Would you proceed then with the meeting of, of uh, October 16, 1991? Can you tell us where that was that you met with Mr. Dahmer on that date? Yes, I met with Mr. Dahmer for three hours and 45 minutes on December, I'm sorry, October 16th, 1991 at the, uh, just off the, just off this courtroom, there's a study, a separate room. Um, and your question was what? Yes, what would you provide the jury the oh, information sure. that you acquired? Okay, I will try to share with you the information I obtained. I will try to <coughs> edit this somewhat, but uh, I, I will walk through, talk through uh, what he told me. Um, <coughs> He started off by pretty much saying that he cherished, uh, unquote, his privacy and he doesn't like all this attention and publicity. And uh, <clears throat> he mentioned that at his job he would uh, get off work in the morning, he would have coffee and donuts, and then he would sleep from about 10 in the morning to about 5 in the afternoon. And that was kind of his routine. Uh, I was 31 years old and he was born on May 21st, 1960, uh, here in Milwaukee. Um, he understood that I was district attorney appointed and he said this did not bother him. Sometimes uh, because you're appointed by a certain side, uh, people think you're uh, biased or a hired gun for that side type experience and sometimes this uh, can impair their trust or your rapport with a defendant. So I try to discuss this up front and uh, reassure them that uh, uh, most examiners are ethical and independent and uh, who appoints them is more a matter of who pays the bill type thing. And, and, uh, and he asked about the length of training I had, and he made the statement that, <coughs> that um, <coughs> his main pleasures in life at that time were the food and cigarettes. And then he made the statement, he said, it's kind of pathetic, <coughs> it's my own fault. If I had chosen a different path, life would have been different, unquote. Um, <coughs> He talked about the conditions in the jail and being watched, and um, then I commented on whether or not he was suicidal. Could I have some more water, please? <clears throat> and he said, honestly, I have no suicidal desire. It would put me in a worse predicament 
I would find myself in hell. So he's unquote. Uh, he said he now believes in heaven and hell, but he was not very religious prior to his arrest. Uh, since his arrest, he said he's had time to do a lot of reading and evaluate his life. He said he never read much before, and he said he just turned on the TV set, and that he received various religious materials from various people while in jail. Uh, he's six feet tall and weighs 170 pounds, and he commented that he never um, put much stock into talking about his life, meaning he wasn't used to opening up so much to people over the years, so this was kind of a new experience for him, and I think beneficial for him and um, provided some relief for him, not only to me, but all the examiners. Um, uh, in regard, thank you. In regard to the suicidal issue, he said that when he was arrested and in regard to Mr. Edwards, that he was intoxicated and that he might have said something about suicide to the police, and that was, uh, but that was not true. He was not suicidal, but apparently because of that utterance, he um, has been under suicidal precautions. Then he mentioned a suicidal case while he was in the Army of uh, another person. He understood the reason for our meeting, and that was in regard to the crimes, and uh, that was, uh, in regard to his special plea, mental non-responsibility, he, he made the comment that he was charged with 17 counts, but uh, it's actually only 15, but he, he realized that, uh, that that was an inaccuracy later. But, and he, he knew the, about when he was arrested around the 27th and at his home, and then he was taken to jail on a Tuesday evening, and that he had been in jail ever since. And I asked him if he was ever sent to uh, any of the forensic hospitals for pretrial observation, and he said he was not. And I also asked if he was on any medications while in jail, and um, he said he was not. Uh, it's nice to know if your person you're talking to is on psychiatric medication. Uh, sometimes they're so sedated or something, it affects the interview, and it also helps in regard to their diagnosis. Uh, if somebody's on antipsychotic medication or something or antidepressants, uh, he was on uh, some cold medication, claimed he caught cold at uh, Columbia Correctional, and he understood that he was at Columbia Correctional on a probation revocation, meaning he was on probation when these offenses occurred. Uh, normally you're not sent to prison pre-trial, but if you're on probation, they can revoke your probation and send you to prison. So that's why he was at Columbia Correctional, which is up near Portage. Then I asked him why he was on, I asked him why he was on probation, <coughs> and he said for taking pictures of a 13, 14 year old uh, individual some years ago, <coughs> that he had a bench trial. <clears throat> and then after his arrest, his, um, he was in jail for about six days and then placed on bail. And his attorney was also Mr. Ball. And uh, <clears throat> prior to that trial, or getting, or he didn't actually have a trial trial, he just had a hearing, but uh, he was also evaluated by uh, a psychologist by the name of uh, Lodell. And he had three meetings with uh, Dr. Lodell, and a report was sent to Mr. Boyle, and he also saw a uh, psychologist with the state. Uh, no one testified at that in regard to that charge, and the reports were submitted, and he was, uh, did not recall the judge that sentenced him, but he was sentenced to one year <clears throat> uh, with work, re <coughs> work release privileges and five years probation. So that was a probation he was on. Uh, that led to his revocation, that led to his being sent to Columbia Correctional. And he was also ordered to, uh, depend, to attend DePaul Hospital here in Milwaukee for uh, outpatient alcohol treatment after completing his um, Huber or work release time. And he was in that program for nine months, the Huber program, not DePaul. And he was released from the Huber program around March of 1989. The DePaul program was an outpatient program, and he was involved in that for about six months. <clears throat> and he had uh, regular meetings, group and individual counseling for alcoholism. <clears throat> and he implied that DePaul did not, wasn't that helpful, and he didn't really consider himself having an alcohol problem, and he didn't crave alcohol. And he said he drank on weekends, and uh, he said that sometimes he went overboard, that was his word, and that's when he got into trouble. Uh, 
he said I drank on weekends during the program and I continued after the program. So clearly in Mr. Dahmer's history is, you know, a long history of alcohol abuse. He's, he's definitely into and has been using alcohol. But he did not think he was an alcoholic. He also said that part of that case, uh, he was ordered for um, outpatient treatment in regard to the sexual aspects of the case. And later arrangements were made to see a Dr. William Crowley, who is a well-known um, Milwaukee uh, psychiatrist and forensic psychiatrist. And apparently Dr. Crowley was consulting with the Department of Probation and Parole and did see Mr. Dahmer on a, let's say about three occasions in 1991. And um, Mr. Dahmer told me that uh, Dr. Crowley was getting to know him, collecting background information, but um, um, Mr. Dahmer certainly did not tell Dr. Crowley about the present charges. And said that Dr. Crowley recommended antidepressant medication, but Mr. Dahmer never got the prescription filled because he didn't think he was that depressed and didn't feel he needed the medication. He was, Mr. Dahmer said he was up somewhat sad and upset over financial problems, but he did not feel clinically depressed. He just said, uh, I was just having feelings of lack of direction and emptiness. Uh, I wasn't crying or suicidal. He, t he said he never told Dr. Crowley about the homicides and he never told anyone over the years. He said, I kept this pretty much to myself. So this is a whole new ball game to me. I mean, he's talking about things and certainly talking about the homicide. He, uh, he said that now, <clears throat> now that this bomb has fallen, there's no need to hide anything. Completely unload my conscience and hide nothing. Uh, it's very clear that he wanted to get everything off his chest. And he said talking about matters has helped. And he made the comment that the pres pressure of con concealing over the years <clears throat> Uh, built up a tremendous amount of pressure. I was very good at suppressing emotions. Denial was a big part of my life. <clears throat> I just buried them, his feelings with alcohol and other, and other things. So it's a relief to be forced to try to put things right. One thing that's clear to me now is that the truth will come out. And he agreed with me that he was leading a double life all these years. He said, I just tried to put it out of my mind, meaning the what he had been doing, suppress it so it wouldn't bother me. Work and activities helped, except on the weekends when I drank and had free time. He said I was becoming obsessed with sex, I guess. It started a long time ago when I was 18, the first time I, first time I made my mistake, and that it's tainted my life, my whole life ever since, unquote. He's referring to the Hicks homicide. We talked about his uh, legal proceedings and his court proceedings and what's been going on. I commonly learn what transpires in court and cases from the defendants. And uh, he basically understood that uh, the nature of his plea, why I was there to see him, and we discussed what the plea was all about and what happens when you're found responsible or non-responsible. And he told me about the other examiners and who they were and uh, mentioned Dr. Plermo and Dr. Smale and uh, a psychologist from uh, the Department of Corrections. Again, asked why he confessed and he said there was, uh, it was to make amends to what I brought into motion. I owe it to the families and not to keep it hidden. And he understood he did not have to talk to the police and he was told this by the police. And he said, um, to make a full and complete confession, there came a time to tell the truth. I've only confessed to the ones that I've committed. It would be ridiculous to try to hide what I had done. The crimes that I have committed, the detectives knew about it fully. About half of them, they would not have had the slightest knowledge. I just want to put an end to it." Unquote. And he said he's shared this information with various examiners, of course, and his attorney. And he, at that time, he had no regrets about confessing to the police. <clears throat> After these introductory comments and uh, orientation, I, I spent most of the first interview going through his background to see who, who I was talking to. And back, back then, of course, he was um, 
new to me, and I'll try to highlight this. It's been commented on before, uh, but uh, as you know, he was born in Milwaukee on May 21st, 1960, and he was here for about one year, and then moved to Ames, Iowa. And about the age of six, the uh, father was in school in Iowa, and uh, then they later moved to Doyle's D-O-Y-L-E-S town, Ohio. And father obtained employment there. And he thought father probably had his PhD by that time in chemistry. They were in Doyle's town for about a year and then moved to Barber Town, Ohio for a couple years and then later to Bath, Ohio. And he said that's where he did most of uh, his growing up and that's where he lived when he was 18 years old. He graduated from high school in Richfield, Ohio, gave the name of the high school in 1978. And he was always in public schools. He was not in parochial schools or private schools. He then went on to one quarter. Ohio State University has been on the quarter system. He had one quarter there in Columbus. And he said, I drank my way through that. I took general studies and did D, like in David, D level work. He said, I was doing so much drinking and then quit. And then his father pretty much urged him to drop out of school. And he also said his parents were separated at that time. He then entered the United States Army in January of 79, and originally was uh, slated to go to a military police school, and that school is at Fort McClellan, Alabama. And he said basic training was quite rough for him, and he applied his weight, went from 220 pounds to 175 pounds, and something went wrong in MP school, and his uh, military assignment was changed from a military policeman to a medic. So he was sent to Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, Texas, to the, what's called the Medical Field Service School. And that's where I took my, that's where physicians are also sent for their medical orientation. So we have that in common. And he took a medical field course for two months. And then he was later transferred to Germany for a couple of years. And he had a three-year enlistment. But he claimed he received a early out about six months early because of his problem drinking while in Germany. He was stationed uh, in Germany, assigned to an armor division, tank and infantry. He performed general duties. He also took outpatient sick call at the post clinic until about 10 in the morning, and then he worked in the motor pool until about five in the afternoon. And he said there was a physician on duty at the clinic. <clears throat> He then made the comment <coughs> that he started drinking alcohol uh, heavily, which was his word, while in high school, beer and whiskey. <coughs> and he also said he drank evening while in Germany. And he said, it was, he said it was pretty miserable trying to do PT runs the next morning with a hangover. And he said, I was a bottomless pit. I would drink so much it was pathetic. So again, this information supports his alcoholic diagnosis. He said he received one Article 15, which is a disciplinary measure, uh, and he said he mouthed off to a lieutenant. A lieutenant he said he never received any alcoholic counseling in the Army and was never sent to a mental health unit uh, in the service. So this, uh, at least he was not under psychiatric care in the military. He was not psychiatrically or medically discharged from the military. This is just background information that helps you start categorizing people uh, diagnostically. So at least he uh, there's no evidence of psychiatric care while in the military. He did receive an honorable discharge. Uh, he denied ever going AWOL and was never in the stockade, so at least he wasn't a major uh, behavioral problem for the military. He wasn't kicked out of the military. And I was involved in numerous administrative and medical discharges from the uh, Army during my three years in the service. He said he knew what he was doing as a medic, but he did not do any suturing. He performed general first aid. He lived in the barracks, and uh, he said he did not do any dating at that time. He told me about uh, a hotel near the post, which was primarily uh, apparently a house of prostitution. He, he went there, but never involved himself with the prostitutes. He said prostitution was illegal in Germany. He was discharged from the Army in March of 81. With all, with all due respect, did you uh, state he had no interest in the prostitutes? 
Yeah. Yes, he did not have any interest in the prostitutes. I think at that time I did not fully appreciate his sexual orientation. I was starting from scratch with this individual. And then he was uh, returned to the States, and I think he was uh, released from Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And then he asked what city do you want a free transportation to, and he decided to try Miami. And he was there for, for about April to September of 1981. Uh, he lived on the beach for a couple weeks until he found a job. And he attained a restaurant, a job in a restaurant as a cook and waiter. And then he later lived in a motel. And he gave the name of the motel and worked long hours. He also said he continued to drink excessively and implied he was eventually fired for coming in late. He then uh, left Miami and returned home back to Bath, Ohio, where father and stepmother were then living. And he was with them for two or three months. And he again said he continued to drink excessively. And he often came home late. And my inference is that he was somewhat of a concern for the family. And what are we going to do about Mr. Uh, their son? And it was decided that he would move in with paternal father's mother, paternal grandmother in West Dallas. And he moved to West Dallas around October of 1981. And then he lived with grandmother for about eight years. Gave me her name and how much he paid her per month. And gave me her present age. Then he later obtained employment in Milwaukee uh, in the blood bank program. <coughs> Around, around 1982, he said he didn't like <clears throat> that work very much. And uh, the pay was low, and he got <clears throat> tired of his job. <clears throat> he was un unemployed for a couple years, <clears throat> from about 83 to 84. And he collected unemployment compensation for about a year and a half. And he la later obtained. Uh, part-time work through an employment agency and was uh, later sent to uh, a, uh, a company here in Milwaukee around 85 and he worked there on a part-time basis and then later was, became a full-time employee and he um, worked the third shift for about six years from 11 in the evening till 7 in the morning and uh, then he was eventually released from that position Involving one of the victims in this case, it was on a Sunday evening. He was with, with this victim, and he was supposed to work that night. And he called in sick, but I guess he had used up most of his sick points. And he thought he had some little more sick credit coming, and there was that misunderstanding. And when he called in sick because he wanted to stay with one of the latter victims in this case, uh, he was uh, he went to work, and he said, uh, "You are dismissed because you've used up all your points." So then he was unemployed for a period of time prior to his arrest. He did admit to me that he missed work at this company uh, because of his drinking. And he estimated he missed work about 12 times during 1991. He told me how much he earned, he had good benefits, how much he netted per week, what he did at the company, what his role was. Uh, he did not have any income after his dismissal, and he did not collect uh, unemployment compensation. He mentioned that after he moved out of uh, living with his grandmother, he moved in an apartment on 24th Street. He was there for a couple months, and uh, he said, while there, a particular Laotian individual caught my eye, and he asked this individual to pose. He took a couple pictures. They had some drinks. He gave this individual some money, and the individual left. This individual told his parents, and about one in the morning that same evening, Mr. Dahmer was arrested at work and taken to jail. And this is approximately 1988. I then learned more about his <coughs> parents, and he told me about his father and uh, his mother. And he's the second born of two children, and he has a 25-year-old brother who's attending college in Ohio. His parents separated around 1978 while they were living in Bath. And when I asked why, he just implied standard irreconcilable differences, and they just didn't get along. 
he said mother moved out and that the separation and divorce was primarily her idea. And he shared some further information about their marital discord. And he said that neither parent uh, was an alcoholic or neither parent was uh, abusive to each other or to him. Uh, he said he got along well with his parents and his, especially his father and they had a good relationship, played tennis, they were close. Uh, said father never had any psychiatric care but mother uh, did have some emotional difficulties over the years and pretty much since living in Ohio and since uh, the birth of uh, her second child, uh, primarily a depressive problem. She saw different mental health people. And when uh, Mr. Dahmer was about 15 years old, uh, mother might have been hospitalized in Akron. And he remembers her complaints being that of chronic fatigue and depression. But that she improved after the, divor <coughs> after the divorce. Um, he said he was somewhat close to his mother, implied he was more close to his father, and that he was discouraged about seeing her unhappy over the years. But he said that uh, she was an effective mother and a good mother, and he said he has cared about her over the years. And he said, I still do, I still love, I still have love for them both. He said he's not bitter towards them, and they separated when he was 18 years old and just before he started college at Columbus. <clears throat> he said mother moved to Chippewa Falls uh, with the brother and uh, father had been <clears throat> moved out of the home because of a court order. <clears throat> Prior to moving up north, um, Mr. Dahmer lived with his brother and mother in Bath, and then mother and brother went to Chippewa Falls. Mother told Mr. Dahmer that she was going to go to Chippewa Falls, and that she did not want this known to father. Uh, Mr. Dahmer stayed at home and did not go with mother because um, he was about to start college. An original concern uh, when I came down the first day and was the issue of abandonment, whether or not this was a shock or whether or not Jeffrey or Mr. Dahmer was just uh, left on his own. And this might be somewhat of a historical significance in understanding his concern about being a left or being abandoned, which is part of his makeup. He has this uh, conflict about uh, being abandoned and one, not wanting people to leave him. But he said it was discussed and uh, he did not feel, feel abandoned. He, he stayed on his own and lived alone in the house because he was about to start college. After he went to college, father moved back to the house. And then father continued living there for a few years. And he was living there when Mr. Dahmer returned to see him after his discharge from the Army. Father later, later remarried uh, to his present wife. A couple years after, mother moved to Chippewa Falls. And he told me where his father is presently employed and where his stepmother is employed. And they're apparently away from each other during the week and but get together on weekends. Um, Mother uh, stayed in Chippewa Falls to about 1987, and then brother returned to uh, Bath and lived with father again. He implied that the divorce was harder on his brother than on himself, and he, he again denied <coughs> that it was a devastating experience for him. It was really not that traumatic to him. That's what he's saying at this point in time, but perhaps, uh, He's minimizing the degree of uh, trauma involved. Mother later moved to California. <clears throat> and he's had a little contact with her over the years, either by telephone or through letters. Uh, he visited her in Chippewa Falls about seven years ago. And while he was living with grandmother in West Dallas, and of course, mother-child relationships are important. And, uh, 
trying to get a little feel for their relationship. And he, he said the mother tried to keep in touch with him, that she would write or call at grandmother's, but he would not talk to her. He said he felt guilty for not keeping in touch. He put off writing letters, and he would not call her or even get on the phone when she was calling. Implied that he has not been missing or longing or pining, P-I-N-I-N-G, for, for her or his parents over the years. Um, once he left home, uh, implied he was not uh, this a needy, uh, homesick type of individual that he, uh, he left home and he didn't strongly miss his parents. He also said he was doing too much drinking, drowning my emotions in alcohol. I tried to forget their uh, later years when their marriage was so bad. And he implied he was never very close to his brother. I asked if uh, later if he thought his family problems were involved in the, his present legal difficulties, and he said, quote, it's not the reason for my being in this situation. I'm not blaming my parents, not in the least. They had nothing to do with this. And I asked him, what, what are you blaming? And he said, I have one person to blame, the person sitting across from you, no one else. No one put a gun to my head. I had choices to make and I made the wrong choices. I could have made different choices in the past. It's obvious to me. If I had more insight, if I had more motivation to find a career. What do you mean, doctor? I said if I had more foresight. You said insight. If I had more foresight. Thank you. If I had more motivation to find a career and worthwhile acts to fill my time <clears throat> rather than drinking my problems away. <clears throat> I drank my emotions and problems away and um, implied that the family life was somewhat. Doctor, why didn't you find a breaking point? Oh, sure. Okay. Um, well, can, you, can you just finish the direct quote? Oh, okay. I could, the, pain a, of, the pain of my There's family. no hurry, but just find some place oh, where it's convenient to break. At the end of the first interview. Sure. Coming up. Okay. <clears throat> I drank my emotions away. The pain of my family situation, the divorce, that's what started it. Is that what you wanted, Mr. Boyle? Yes, Trying to do some editing here. Well, I don't care if you do that, but no. if you do a quote, I want Sure, to that's fine. You mentioned he was then alone in the house before going to college, and um, he mentioned a friend of his, and that this uh, friend was a uh, very much into marijuana and alcohol, and uh, got Jeff, uh, Mr. Dahmer involved, and said they were friends during the last couple of years of high school, and uh, the two of them did a fair amount of smoking marijuana and drinking alcohol. And he also said that once mother left the house, that his daily alcohol increased when he, when he was kind of on his own. He then mentioned the Hicks homicide, that during the time that he was uh, and be living alone and before college. He picked up a hitchhiker by the name of Stephen Hicks, and he said this individual was wearing short pants and tennis shoes, and he picked him up on the spur of the moment. And he told the individual that he had marijuana and alcohol at home, and he said, quote, the first mistake that led to, up to all this, had I driven past, all this would not have happened. And he also implied that his strange behavior started with animals. <clears throat> and he said his friend in high school would like to drive fast and hit dogs. <clears throat> and that his friend's behavior made, he said, made me sick, unquote. <clears throat> in regard to his path, past health, he said he had double hernia surgery when he was three or four years old. He's had a hay fever. He's had a shoulder problem and was on a steroid here in Milwaukee and was treated with uh, a steroid for about a year. He said his first legal difficulty was while in Bath, uh, a drunken disorderly charge while living with his father and stepmother, and this was after his discharge from the Army. He denied any prior involvement with the law before that. He said he was, uh, quote, very drunk and obnoxious. I was involved in a police scuffle 
He was in jail overnight in Akron in around 1981. He mentioned a couple arrests for drunk and disorderly uh, in West Dallas. And he had two or three overnight stays in the Milwaukee County Jail and was fined. He was once arrested for urinating in the State Fair Park and charged with drunk and disorderly. He denied getting involved in bar fights, but he said he would not drink alcohol at home. He would always go out to taverns to drink. He was arrested once for shoplifting, and I asked why, and he said, quote, I was, he was short, unquote, on money, and he wanted a coat, and he gave the name of the store and where it was, and uh, and he was um, caught and spent one night in jail and fined $25. He was later arrested for lewd and lascivious behavior and said he was exposing himself in a park in West Dallas and that some minors were walking through the park and there were 13 or 14 year olds, three boys. He stood about 50 feet away in a heavily wooded area. They saw him and he wanted them to see him. He had his penis out and was masturbating. Uh, they laughed and left and the police came later and he was taken to jail for a couple of days. He was fined and ordered to receive counseling and was on probation for about one year. And that's when he started seeing Dr. Rosen. He saw her on a regular basis for about one year and discontinued the visits once his probation ended. And he said these sessions were not helpful and um, but he, he was supposed to be seeing her for any sexual problems, but he did not want to talk to her. And I asked him about his exposing behavior and his masturbating in front of men. He said this went on for about a year and started while he was living in West Dallas and he would expose himself and masturbate in front of teenage boys and some adult men. And then he would fantasize about the kids and would just masturbate, but he would not ejaculate. In somewhat typical exhibitionistic fashion, he said he wanted to observe their reactions, and he said a good reaction would be for them to stare and watch in, in an admiring way. Uh, he said most people that saw him would pretend not to see him and walk by, and he did this for about a year while living in West Dallas, and he stopped doing this after his arrest. As mentioned before, he started using marijuana while in, while in high school, and he discontinued his marijuana usage after graduating from high school. He tried hash a couple times in Germany, but he's never used cocaine, and he denied involvement with other street drugs, uh, so he doesn't have a strong past history of drug involvement, which is part of a general forensic and psychiatric assessment to uh, pretty much rule out that diagnostic consideration. He did say he started drinking alcohol while in high school, but it's somewhat tapered, unquote, during the last six years, and he would drink primarily only on weekends. He said a heavy bottle of drinking for him would involve a 12-pack and some Yukon Jack uh, whiskey, which I think is about 110 proof. And he would continue to drink the next, the next day and evening. He estimated he might have had a case of beer on weekends and at bars. Then he mentioned that around 1985, he first discovered gay bars and he felt comfortable in that atmosphere and he liked the live entertainment there, the male strippers. He admitted that he commonly had blackouts from his drinking, which is a sign of rather advanced drinking and experience with drinking, meaning it's, it's a later manifestation of, with experienced drinkers. His first blackout was in the Army when he uh, missed his tour bus uh, back to the base, and he told me all about that. <clears throat> he said his only alcohol treatment was at DePaul here in Milwaukee. Uh, then he had to be returned to his cell. So the, in closing, uh, some rapid questions for my immediate <coughs> curiosity. Uh, getting, I wanted a quick and early comment on some f fundamental issues I had with him, and so these are pretty much stand-up questions as we're leaving the room, but he said he was admitting to 17 homicides, and he then told me that he realized he'd been gay since he was 13 years old, and that he's never had any feelings toward women. <clears throat> he estimated he's had sexual contact with about 100 different men, and sometimes he did not have to pay for their involvement. 
that he mentioned once he was paid $10. I asked him, were you ever paid? I said, are you paying other people? Were you ever paid? And he mentioned that he was paid once $10 by an older man, 65 years of age. And they went to a bathhouse and he gave this man a blowjob. Uh, he said about half of the time he would have to pay someone to have sex. He said if someone caught his eye, unquote, he would pay them to have sex, he usually paid them $50. He estimated he has paid someone about 25 times in Chicago and Milwaukee, sometimes would bring people back to Milwaukee. And then he, when I asked, he said he likes what he called, quote, light sex, L-I-G-H-T sex, unquote. This was to lay around with each other, mutual masturbation, watch videos, and he does, does not like, quote, heavy sex, unquote, which he implied uh, involved anal intercourse. He implied he likes mutual blowjobs with his partner. And then, of course, the $64 question is, I asked him, why would you go one step further beyond this and kill them? And then he first mentioned something about, quote, craving control, unquote, and, quote, dominating, unquote, over them. And he said he wanted to keep the individuals with him longer. And then when I asked him about all the dismembering, and he implied this was not for sexual gratification, and I used the word, uh, you know, it was an administrative function. He said he liked my word administrative for handling all the remains. And then he was taken away, and that was the end of my first interview. We'll take a recess at this point. Courts and recess.